Okay, so uh, we are going to have a panel discussion, and uh, we actually uh, have a com we have composed of uh, a nice panel, uh, uh, and the panel is going to be moderated by Larry Larry Snyder and Eric Herzog, and yeah, so please come here and <laughs> and Garrett, yeah, and also. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was a roast and of Roger. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you promised. And Roger is supposed to be also here, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> and, then, and then we can uh, also have you. Yeah, also Nathan. Yeah. So, okay. Right, so our panelists, uh, again, are, are Nathan Cutts, uh, Garrett Stanley, uh, and Larry Snyder, and Eric Herzog. We'll go ahead. Yeah, and I guess if you have... Uh, Questions that you wanted to ask uh, in in the morning or in the afternoon sections, and then you did not have a chance to ask, and now it's a good time to to discuss and and to ask. Maybe, maybe we could kick things off by describing the talk. I'll start things off. Um, so I'm glad Nathan's here because um, I saw, at least at a very high level, some similarity between Nathan's talk and Roger's in that they were both pushing for simplicity. Um, and, you know, Roger was very vehemently pushing away from the, the, the deep learning and, and going for the, uh, the shallow learning and the, the shallow network approach. And for those who weren't here, I'll, I'll let you maybe fill them in, but Nathan was describing a very, very um, seemingly straightforward approach to modeling very complex systems with just AX equals B, but we saw a lot of ri richness come out of that, and I, I wonder if you could maybe kind of help help us connect a bit, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, oh, but um, um, connect a bit that, that sort of level of thinking, because I think Roger was in some high level arguing for something a bit s similar. Um. Yeah, so I, I live in a place called Seattle, and we are full of data scientists these days. We have uh, Amazon, which is growing at a phenomenal rate. So this is going to get to your question, but uh, Google's there, Microsoft. Uh, you know, and it's interesting, uh, the, the, the framework there is they're going towards deep learning architectures. Uh, for them, uh, the ultimate goal is a better predictor than you. And if I can beat your prediction by even a fraction of a percent, I will win because they, they actually make money. Um, and, you know, it, it goes back to uh, there was a, a paper in 84 written by Leo Bryman at Berkeley where he talked about statistical learning versus machine learning. So this conflict has been around in uh, data science for quite a while, which is the machine learning was all about, you know, I just want a better predictor. I don't care how I get it even if it's an extremely complicated model. But if I beat your prediction, uh, that is a, a step forward in that. And then the statistical learning was more about thinking about what can I infer about the system I'm measuring. So it had a little bit more of an angle around uh, potentially parsimony. And so, um, so I think maybe our philosophy here, and I'm not going to speak for Roderick because I'm sure he has uh, many more sophisticated things to say than I do, but I think I always think about Parsimony being important for an interpretability, especially if we're going to try to do neuro and biology. We, we kind of need things we can understand out of it so that we can build the next generation down. And so I think these methods that uh, aim to maybe not get the best predictor but give you insight, that, that's a really important role for, I think, the scientist to be playing uh, because I think we can beat we can write deep neural nets that beat every prediction we can, we're going to make with other models. I mean, I think that's, that might be true if you give enough training data. So I, I like, I, at least that's, that's kind of my framing of how I th see things. But if you're going to work at Amazon or Google, you might want to go the other way with that. <laughs> I don't know what other people's thoughts are on that, but that's, that's at least one perspective.
Okay, well, um, great question. I, um, so I think there's a, a couple ways to think about this a little bit. So, uh, I, I, so I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about data for a while now, and, and the, the one example I really like to think about is, is you, you start thinking about uh, Kepler versus Newton um, and what they did with data. So Kepler had Tycho Brock's data. It took him 11 years. Back then, that was big data because he only had pen and paper. And he took 11 years, and he published his uh, famous Rodolfo. I don't even know how to say the name of the book. But uh, he, he showed that these elliptic orbits were there. He could do these amazing predictions of planetary motion. Um, and it, to me, that reminds me of a machine learning trick where you say, like, I got this predictor. Uh, but the one thing he couldn't do that Newton could, because Newton wrote down F equals MA. He developed the calculus for it. Uh, and he found these elliptic orbits, were, which Kepler already had. Uh, but what he could do is say, well, with this general principle, uh, he could imagine the concept of launching a rocket to the moon. He could imagine concepts of escape uh, uh, velocities to get out of the Earth's gravitational pull, uh, or orbits, or Holman transfers. You have all these concepts that were not... What Kepler could do was give predictions for things he had seen and maybe slight generalizations away where Newton could, you could imagine doing something new. Now, for the biology, the way I think about it is what we have is a tool to try to build models with parameterizations that will work potentially in some space. And I always think about building suites of models that you may transition into other dynamical states. You go through bifurcations, and there may be multiple states, and you, Garrett, mentioned this, like, you know, how many brain states are there? Well, I, I mean, that's a really complicated question uh, to answer, but I think the, the more robust models we can build in different regimes, we can potentially think about models that transition between these states. I think we think about fundamental things that happen, like diffusion, wave propagation. We, we think a lot of models have some of these basic things that are in them, and, but it, it's the combination. And if you can start putting those atoms of pieces together of dynamics, you have some shot at continuing to push forward and seeing what that happens with that. I also believe in multi-scale stuff. And that's, that, that's even, like, to me, that's, uh, that's a... In biology, I think we have so much of that that it's, we, we still write down uniscale models you know, scale physics models, like here's the one equation. It's like, no, here's the equation for this level. It's connected to the equation at this level. It's connected to the equation at this level. And I think we have to discover them all to get a good picture. Right so, right, so in fact, that's what I was going to comment on. For those who were not there earlier, 
one of the the presentation I made earlier was uh, acknowledging potentially um, two sets of dynamics that could coexist and switch back and forth between um, two different states of the brain. And rather than doing something sophisticated and coming up with one all-encompassing model, we punted a bit and made two different models that allowed us to switch back and forth in the control. And I think what we're getting at is that's obviously not the end game. You want to zoom out and have a model that captures um, potentially all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. Could you elaborate on what models you're referring to? Are they, you mean the ones that were present, presented by Professor Brockett or today or? Okay. Try the question in a somewhat less convoluted way. This work? Uh, there's no reason you couldn't choose lasso or something like that with the um, recurrent networks and reduce the complexity to whatever level you were comfortable with. So I don't see that as a fundamental issue. Um, if, you, if you are worried about overfitting, then throw away the small coefficients. I think I'm done. <laughs> so it was a it, it was a linear, unconvoluted question. <laughs> so so I, I'd rather I'd rather hear the answers that the graduate students give because they're the they're the future. They're the ones who will who will be leading the who will be asking the questions in the future that will take us forward. Or, or so I'd, I'd be. So you, you were a kind of what will you avoid? <laughs> <laughs> what, will you avoid? <laughs> what will you avoid? What will you avoid? When do you choose? When do you, what do you think is a good problem where modeling is required versus some where modeling or control theoretic solution or not? You guys can tell who you are because I know we have listened to them. We don't know who you are. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah, so um, we, uh, Larry Snyder and Eric Herzog are co-directors of the Neuroscience Graduate Program here at Washington University. And um, Barani's question is a great one and one we get uh, often um, from undergraduates, interestingly. And graduate students don't ask uh, how to pick an important question and when to apply computations. So um, my experience has been um, that one answer that people find satisfying is uh, how do you gr get your grant funded? Um, so you answer the question with a question, and so we talk about significance and innovation, and uh, what do those mean to people today? And sometimes the computational method is the innovation or is the way around um, a hurdle that we've had uh, previously. Um, and so, uh, you know, for example, um, we heard about 
inferring dynamics in a system today. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in inferring connectivity in neural networks. Uh, we haven't heard about that yet today. Um, inferring coupling functions. Um, those are things where I think the computational methods have really pushed the neuroscientists to start looking for uh, underlying mechanisms. So I'm Gareth Stanley, uh, Georgia Tech. I was one of the speakers earlier today for those who weren't there. Um, I have a strong bias uh, towards um, computational problems that ultimately lead to some experimental um, uh, paradigm so they can be tested experimentally. So I, th I think that even if you are not personally doing experimental work, um, one wants to think about problems that someone else perhaps could pick up and experimentally validate because I think there's sort of a sea of problems that we could work on and I think constraining it a bit with um, with direct uh, testing and experiments is important. On the flip side, I'll contradict myself by saying perhaps that that's a little bit um, of, of interpolation rather than extrapolation, right? That we need to be pushing the field to develop new technologies to measure more things, to measure different things that, that maybe we currently can't. So somewhere in the middle of that um, would, be, would be my bias. Uh, I think for me, I, I, I think it's, uh, for those of you who are grad students, I, I think it'd be really hard to be a grad student now in the sense, in the following sense, the, uh, what, what you need to know is, is keeps growing, right? We, now you gotta know, differential equations and linear algebra and computation. Now you need to know data science it, it, and even what people are doing in the lab. It, it's so diverse that I th finding a way to sort of even bring down the range of things down to things that are useful for you, I think it's a, it's a great deal of pressure on people to really know what beyond PCA, right? I mean, you, you kind of need to go beyond PCA. Uh, but, but then you need to also then invest a lot of time in doing theory, but then uh, well, are you going to spend time in the lab doing how much time you're going to spend in the lab and I don't, I don't know I think I don't I haven't seen a good strategy yet for that my strategy is at least as an as an older person I, I rely a lot on my collaborators for that I, I I know I can't be as expert in the biology so I but I connect with people who I rely on them to be that and if for grad students it feels more awkward because they feel like they got to take it all on and build this big PhD project, but I think more and more of that's trickling down to the grad students where uh, I think for them to scope out a project somewhere between theory and experiment and having to know so much is really a lot of pressure. And so I think there's actually a lot on us to help them with that process um, in that. So anyway, I think it's become harder to select a problem. <laughs> So I, I'm not going to answer that question, but I think I think there is a big opportunity now of of taking some of the ideas that have been developed in 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 motor control and in neuroscience on the systems side and applying them to the to the cellular molecular side because I think there that's a whole field that's really crying out for much more principled approaches to 
organizing the data that they have. So, so that's one thing I would, would say. My, my guess is that there aren't too many cellularly oriented folks here in the audience, but, but if there are, I think that's a real, a, a real terrific opportunity. <laughs> Good. So, um, so I think this idea of uh, moving across scales is an important and celebrated approach. And so picking questions that you find burning for yourself and then asking whether you can uh, take your – let's, let's – um, you know, often people are preoccupied with diseases and human health. Um, but let's just to be different today – um, take something like um, biodiversity as a goal. Um, you could you could address that at the level of very local, small scales and ask questions. How do I increase biodiversity in my neighborhood? Um, and then connect your model to somebody who's got a, a model for the state and then somebody who's got a model for the continent or the globe. Um, and I think that becomes very exciting because you create a community like Roger talked about. And if you have a community of people who are interested in your problem, you're going to be celebrated. You're going to feel motivated. Um, and so if you find yourself isolated, um, working on a problem that you and you alone find interesting, that makes uh, moving forward even more challenging. So where I'll give you a personal example. I work on single cell oscillators. They are beautiful oscillators. Um, and uh, what can be modeled at the level of the single cell can describe uh, the limits of robustness of the system. And when those cells are connected to other cells, we get new properties. And when those cells connect to other cells, we get a whole system that entrains to the environment. And so we have mathematicians and biologists and even physicists and people interested in traffic control who've gotten interested in the data um, because it affects things at different levels. So if you've got a really interesting question and you can capture the interest like some of the speakers today um, of others, you'll find yourself motivated from, from people in front of you and behind you. Probably a matter of what what system you're looking at. So I, I think some of the older systems, like the ocular motor system, there's an awful lot of data out there about what the different parts are doing, uh, what what individual cells are doing in different circumstances. I, I I've been struck about the importance of having really clear inputs and clear outputs um, when you do your modeling, being sure you've picked the right inputs and that you have clear outputs. And I think that's an advantage of the ocular motor system. It's, it's, a, it's, a difficulty, it's a difficulty with some of the more modern computational efforts as I think that becomes tricky and that's part and parcel of this 
problem of getting more data. But I bet he had fun doing it. <laughs> but he did it uh, more than a decade ago and hasn't done it since. <laughs> Some things you do just once. Um, always the next five <laughs> so if I can pivot away from that really hard question. Um, coming back to the previous question, I forgot who asked it, a big question, big open. For me, one of the things that's always really intrigued me about the nervous system, the brain in particular, is just how damn noisy it is, and yet, um, and yet we have stable percepts of the world, and we go about our business mostly. Uh, and so I think I think there's a really interesting problem in the middle of all of that is is resolving that um, that those two facts.